I think it would be helpful to just take a moment to really remember that first panel and just how amazing those young Democrats are that are this new generation of our Democratic Party. We did not have that 20 years ago when we began that. What we've worked to collectively has led to this moment that has elevated those voices. And to be really just in this moment, the Progressive Caucus, Congressional Progressive Caucus has over 100 members. Half the Democratic Caucus is Progressive Caucus members. The Blue Dogs, they have six. They have six. We are seeing a definite shift in the direction of our party. Uh, Chewy, you have, you've been watching this sort of shift, this transition. How does that feel like from the inside? It feels great. It reminds me of 40 years ago in Chicago when the Rainbow Coalition first came together, elected a black progressive member of Congress, Chicago's first progressive black mayor. And it was significant because it began to dismantle the old Chicago corrupt, racist, and sexist machine. In Congress, we've seen grassroots organizing elect progressives make the Progressive Caucus the largest caucus in Congress, and we've seen our leader, Pramila Jayapal, negotiate key elements that move us forward in an inclusive manner, transforming, beginning the transformations of the types of things that need to happen domestically. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're on the right track, and more people than ever believe that we can address climate change, we can address civil rights, voting rights, women's rights, restore reproductive rights, increase the minimum wage to a living wage, and ensure that there is shared prosperity. So in my four plus years in Congress, that's what <laughs> I've seen. I am Elder so <laughs> honored to be a part of it, but we're on the right track. And looking at the elections for next year, very promising if we don't blow it, and as long as we keep raising the issues that affect everyone in our country, that will be another great step as we begin to transform our country, and thus, by the same token, the rest of the world, because there are many foreign policy international implications to what we do in Congress. All right. Pramila, the congressional, I'm going to be, maybe I won't be diplomatic, but the Progressive Caucus wasn't really a factor in anything in the past. It was a title that some people wore. It really had no juice. It had no, no, no pull. Nobody took it seriously. That has changed under you. What's going on? What have you done to whip that caucus into shape? Well, thank you. I'm an organizer and I'm an institutional person. Like, what structures do we need to build so that we bring people in and then they can be successful. Because otherwise you can have really progressive members. It's not that we didn't, I mean, we've had Jan, we've had Keith Ellison, Raul Grijalva, really progressive members, but there was no collective structure to require us to use our organized power together. And so when I came in, that was part of what I saw. I was like, oh my God, this is what I'm coming into. There's nothing here to like really support us coming together as a collective block. So we pass rules reforms. You know, it's just too bad because I think part of what we have to do is understand who it is we're fighting and what, where we target our energy. So we've tried to be more strategic about that. We've tried to unite people. We've tried to um, actually develop the infrastructure to fund candidates like Summer Lee and Delia who had enormous amounts of money coming in against them. We've given leadership roles to people like Chewy, who really has shown what he can do right here in Chicago to take on the machine. And all in all, I think we're trying to build a stronger united force where people understand that compromising doesn't mean if you want to um, detain 100 people and I want to detain zero, that we end up with 50. What we need is a principled compromise where people move forward, maybe not as far as we want to go because we're always progressives who want more, 
but that there is a principle that nobody gets pushed behind in order for somebody else to move forward. And that we don't just settle for incremental change without even pushing hard. Like we can stand up and fight and we don't even have to win every fight. Sometimes just the fight is worthwhile and figuring out that strategy and then doing a lot of things also to build the progressives in, the strength of progressives in the Senate and to really have it be House and Senate together. So there's been a lot that's gone into it and I'm really <laughs> just so proud of our members and of the executive board, of our diversity um, and of the unity that we have towards each other, recognizing the strength of the opposition that is outside of this room, outside of this building, and very, very well funded. So, Jan, we're gonna, we're gonna try this again. <laughs> you've been in Congress longer than, than these two, um, and so you, you've been in the inside seeing that transition from a front row seat. So I'm curious how it looks like from your vantage. You've been a strong, unapologetic progressive your entire career, but the party always wasn't like that. So what, what has that transition looked like for you? Well, first of all, let me say when I got to Congress um, in 1999, there were 36 women in the House of Representatives. Uh, we represented about 13% of the makeup of the Congress. Well, we're still not there at parity, but we now have twice as many women in, and, and one of the things about the women, you saw that there are now young women. When I ran for, for Congress, you really didn't see um, young women there. Um, mostly it was women whose children were already grown, and you know we're, we're not representing of the younger generation. I think it is so thrilling to see the representatives that were here today, and they, there are many more of the young people in the, in the Congress. And the idea that you can run and win at 25 years old, as, Ma as Maxwell has, um, is I think something liberating for all of us, and to be a leader at any age and to be a change maker at, at, at any age. But it is also true that really the Progressive Caucus had its whole renaissance when Pramila Jayapal became the chair of the Progressive Caucus. There's no question about it. But we were all ready for That's it right. as well. Exactly. I mean, there were people, people um, who were longtime progressives like myself who were so ready to be able to change policy, to be players in the um, formation of the policies that we were, we were going to take. And I want to say, in this country right now, I heard you, um, Pramila, say earlier um, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, talking about, about poverty, but here in this United States of America, especially today, if you see what the Republicans are doing, that we have come too far tolerating things like homelessness or hunger in this country. And it's not just a matter of tweaking. We have to say that the United States of America, the richest country in the world, at the richest moment in history, we demand that we have equality and equity in our economy, and we're gonna fight to the finish to get there. Those of us on the outside, even watching the, the Republicans just sort of like walk off a cliff, they're not, they're not even attempting to talk to voters anymore. Yeah. It's, it's actually quite shocking, but I'm actually really curious, and I bet a lot of people would be too, What's it like seeing them on the inside when the cameras aren't rolling and the reporters aren't around? Are they as angry and hateful of everything in, you know, as individuals as they are when they present to the world? We get, I get asked that question all the time and I have really good conversations with some of them and some of them are not what they are on TV, but some of them are and in a way it almost doesn't matter because what they're doing is crazy and cruel and completely unjust. And so I've kind of 
I understand that I work with strange bedfellows sometimes, um, you know, in taking on privacy. I was questioning Christopher Wray the other day in, in Judiciary Committee, and I was really questioning the FBI director on our civil liberties, on our privacy protections, and I got so much praise from the Republicans, from Matt Gates, from Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan has yeah. never said anything nice about me, but he did that day. <laughs> and I think for me, it's about how do we just, we, we can, say that these people are, some of them are, you know, nice people, but some of them are not. And at the end of the day, we just have to look at their behavior. And their behavior is cruel. We have to take it on. We cannot accept it. We cannot say, oh, that's not that bad anymore because they keep making it worse and worse and worse. We have to call it out. Call out the cruelty. Call out the bullying. Call out the racism. Call out the xenophobia. Because if we don't, we are letting ourselves think that this is normal. None of this is normal. And we have to push back on it. Yeah. There are definitely Republicans who know better who may be in the privacy of their home or in a private conversation will say this is ridiculous. And yet when the votes come down, all of them go along with each other. Now we are in a situation right now where we know the majority of Americans want to do something serious about gun violence. So the, every single member of the House of Representatives has signed a discharge petition that if you get enough people, members, to sign it, we will get a vote on ending gun violence, at least some of the, the measures. So we have every single Democrat, and all we need, I think, is three or four more Republicans. And you know, the politics, thanks to all the activists, on gun violence has really changed. The American people are with us, you thank guys. you very much. And yet, they have not, at least to date, and I'm not holding my breath, to see if we can just get three more Republicans. They are chicken shit. They are afraid to go against the, the party. And I think their calculation is, I don't want to lose a primary election then I certainly can't win re-election. But you know, I want to make this point. There are now 18 districts held by Republicans right now that Joe Biden won. That means there are 18 vulnerable Republicans right now. We especially have to hold them accountable and say if they ever plan to win an election, they better sign on with us for the American people. We can win this. We can do this. So it, it's very hard to be able to say that there are still moderates in the Republican Party yeah, based true. on the voting records. But let us not forget that Donald Trump has taken the Republican Party hostage and is holding them hostage. And that may last through the next presidential election. But this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate to the American people that Republicans are out of touch. They're they out are. of touch on reproductive rights. They're right. out of touch by continuing to attack the LGBTQ community, yes. by banning books, by legislating hatred against the trans community, and on many other issues. This is an opportunity for us to continue to organize, to continue to bring the issues that matter to the American people to the fore. That is the key for success in taking a majority in the House of Representatives, keeping the Senate, and keeping the White House. That will help free up That's the right. hostages who want to be more reasonable, who want to be more moderate, who can cross the line and restore some level of bipartisanship. Let's not lose sight of that. But right now, the conditions favor progressive politics and continued change and transformation if we do our work across this land. Yes. Can I make one point? Please. You should know that yesterday, in a vote on the um, 
on, on, on uh, funding the military, they passed an amendment that, that changed the rules that said that the military will no longer pay for women who want to travel to have reproductive health, to have an abortion. They will have to pay for that on their own. They passed that amendment. They also um, want to make sure that the military does not um, provide any kind of help for, in health care for transgender people. They passed legislation to prohibit that. They don't want to allow any of these kinds of issues. They, they're adding that to the military budget. It's bad enough. I hardly ever vote. I think once in my life voted for the increase in the military budget. Um, but now they want to add all these cultural things to the military budget decisions. I mean, they are absolutely disgusting. And right now, they managed to get those votes. We have to get rid of them, and we have to take the majority. They didn't only get those votes on that amendment, but Nancy Mace, the Republican who's been blasting Republicans for those culture war issues, including abortion, voted for that amendment. That's exactly right. So they talk, even when they talk, they cannot escape the vote. That's right. It's kind of amazing. And of course, it's unpopular. Even in Kentucky, the effort to, uh, to, you know, to eliminate abortion at the ballot box failed. Yeah. And the doubling down gives me a lot of hope for next year. And I'm optimistic the 18 Biden districts, the new generation of candidates that, that are still emerging. I mean, this is, this is an ongoing process. Well, who we saw on stage before wasn't the end result as part of this progressive uprising that we're seeing. So I'm feeling extremely positive. What does a Democratic House look like next year? Are you still going to be chair of the Progressive Caucus? No, I instituted two terms because I think we should have term limits on leadership and bring in new people. So, um, so I will not be the chair. I'll be like a senior advisor or something, you know, but, um, and I'm really excited to see the new leadership emerge. But look, I think a Democratic House um, with a Democratic Senate that eliminates the filibuster. Because I, I just, I know I talk about this all the time, but we just, we have to do it. And we have to help people understand why this is so important, because otherwise they feel like we've let them down, right? But here's what we can do. We can pass universal childcare, universal pre-K. We can pass a, a living wage, at least a $15 minimum wage. We can get rid of that tipped minimum wage. We can pass voting rights. We can make Washington, D.C., uh, give them statehood so that people in D.C. can actually vote. Same with Puerto Rico. We can pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We can pass the For the People Act and get money out of politics. Those are very real things. So is, by the way, the investments in housing that we had in Build Back Better. So is the ability for free college, like Bernie and I have been pushing for for a long time. And we can start to take on not just 10 drugs, but many more drugs to actually bring the healthcare system to care about people instead of profits. But very, very quick, last thing I wanna say is, do not think, when people say to you, politics is the art of the possible, just say back to them as a way to tell you not to hope for big things, right? You've heard that. Just say back to them, if politics is the art of the possible, it is our job as activists wherever we sit to push the boundaries of what is seen as possible. The possible is not static. You are changing it every single day, and I'm grateful to you. And let's not forget that while Republicans have banked on scapegoating immigrants, immigration reform is doable. We can do it. It is the most frustrating thing that I have experienced in my four plus years, but we think the next two years will all open up new possibilities right. with Republican votes because they will be freed of the yoke of Trumpism in this country, hopefully forever. Let's remember that was a backlash against the country electing the first black president to a great degree we can do a huge blow to racism. And don't forget that it was the Progressive Congressional Caucus that 
set the stage in the Build Back Better legislation that would truly be transformative for families, for working people, and for addressing climate change. That is the unfinished work that we've got to carry out. Okay, and if I could have one more, one more word. So when we say we, we mean you, me, everyone. It's all about turnout. This is not rocket science. This is making sure that every single person makes a plan. All of the activists make a plan. All of your friends, relatives, and co-workers make a plan on getting to the polls. And now is the time to do that. And I like to, to, to end things like this by saying, when we fight, we, we win. win. When we fight, we, we win. win. When we fight, we, we win. win. So we have to be fighting, voting, and organizing. So I know we're supposed to wrap up. I'm going to sneak in one last question <laughs> uh, because we brought up Build Back Better. And uh, I was not a Biden supporter in the primary, to say the least. I've been pleasantly surprised by the presidency. I don't think he gets enough credit. What do you guys think? I agree. I, 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 was, I was not a big Joe Biden fan. It has now been incredible to see what an ally we've created in the White House. Amazing. It's because of people power, the growth of the Progressive Caucus as well, and that our communities, that Rainbow Coalition, delivered the key states that enabled us to win the Senate. Right. And we held the line. Yeah, I, just on Biden, I was a Bernie, I was a Bernie supporter, um, and you know, I would have been thrilled with Elizabeth. And so when Biden was in, I was like, oh man. But I gotta tell you, having worked with him for the last two years, he is, absolutely following through on the domestic economic policy pieces of this. Uh, not everything, I'm not saying I agree with everything, but there is no question absolutely. that the approach to the economy is about lifting all workers up. I mean, just think about the fact that we invested $65 billion into environmental justice for the first time ever, right? We're protecting public lands, we're doing all of these things, and so I am a Biden fan now, and but I think we got to have strong people in the administration, continue to have people like Lena Khan at the FTC, people like Rohit Chopra at the CFPB, continue to have those people surrounding him, and you all in the states forcing this agenda, which is usually a campaign agenda, to be the agenda that he pursues when he wins the White House again with your help. So, I think that's things. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> We've got a great year ahead of us. Let's organize. Let's get the next generation of Democrats elected.